from the Atlantic Monthly's article published this week. Raccoon dogs, creatures commonly bred for sale in China, are also already known to be one of many mammal species that can easily catch and spread the coronavirus. Yeah. That's the sentence, which written badly, yes. Written badly intentionally or unintentionally, who's to say? But from that sentence, we cannot tell. We do not know anything we, about you know, the coronavirus. There's not a the coronavirus. Yeah, there's not a the coronavirus. Right. What's more, um, as far as I know, that statement, to the extent that it could be narrowed to something meaningful, like, hey, here's an animal that actually transmits this coronavirus, right. isn't right. And right? It, because there are a wide variety of animals that have contracted SARS-CoV-2. Yes. But in terms of those who are capable of transmitting it to people, the list is tiny. It's yeah. really... Are raccoon dogs like mink in this regard? Which would be something. And boy, like for those who will say, well, why, you know, why are you picking on this? This is, this is part of the point, right? Literally, there's no science out there yet. There is nothing written that has been shared publicly. And you know, we, along with many others, have been taken to task for talking about um, papers that are posted on preprint servers that haven't yet been peer-reviewed. There is no paper. There is no research. There is no write-up. There is no ability to analyze what has happened except for these two articles, both of which are basically borrowing from one another and which rely on interviews with, with sources that are known, at least in one case, at least in the case of the author of the Atlantic article, to already be longtime friendly with these same sources who will not stray from their conclusion regardless of what other evidence shows up. This is not Science. It's not science. And, you know, you can actually, one thing that struck me, I read the New York Times version of this, um, was that one of the authors of this paper that does not exist is confident that raccoon dogs existed in the stall from which these swabs were taken in 2014 when he happened to be there. Wow. Right. Yeah. So, I know. Like, really? What were you... This is it's, it, this is anecdotal nonsense. The idea that that constitutes some kind of evidence worth reporting in the New York Times about some paper that we haven't seen and can't see. Look, we know, right? The the cold fusion episode, right? The problem was they went to the press before there was anything to scrutinize, right? We know that this is a no no. Journalistically speaking, they shouldn't do this for a reason. Now that's very different than a preprint, a preprint in which. At the point yes. that the conclusion emerges, we can also scrutinize the methodology. Mm -hmm. right? And that's and it's and it's and it's good because all of us can scrutinize it, as opposed to oh well, it's been peer reviewed, therefore you can trust that it's already been vetted. Well, it's been vetted by people who may or may not have had a perverse incentive to either actually definitely um, let that get published or definitely not let that get published. Right. So the preprint servers. I mean, and we've talked about this. You know, three years ago. Three years ago and you know two years and 11 months ago and two years and 10 months ago like you know at in the spring of 2020 it was the wild west in terms of the preprint servers and it was amazing because so much was available and no you couldn't keep up no you couldn't read everything just as you can't read all the stuff that's peer-reviewed but what you knew was the stuff that was out there um that was on preprint servers you could assess for yourself and maybe you had the skills and maybe you didn't uh, but at least it didn't have an additional level of editorial control between you and your ability to assess, which if the editors are great and if the peer reviewers are great, then fine, that'll help. That'll help you not have to wade through so much of the chaff to get to the wheat. But as we know, back to your point, right, about the capture and the corruption and the ways that you have wingmen effectively playing, you know, entities playing wingman to, you know, the desire to not have the truth come out. We have, we have a problem that is multivariate and deeper than I think almost any of us could have imagined. Right. And, you know, there's, I did not see any mention of why it is they were reporting the conclusion before the emergence of the paper. Now, if the paper is ready to go enough that they reporters could have looked at it and 
decided for themselves whether it was worth reporting, they could put it on a preprint server, yeah. right? And they could say, this paper, which is now going through peer review, right, but is available here in its preprint version, they could have done that. And they didn't do that. And that is a tell. And the tell is what we want is the report. In other words, the report in the Atlantic and the New York Times are the purpose of this research, mm -hmm. right? The research itself is beside the point. And in fact, st <coughs> stalling and delaying so that we can't scrutinize it and then predicting that, oh, well, certainly skeptics will emerge. Geez, maybe you did crappy research. And of course, you know that the skeptics are going to come after you because they're going to notice that it was crappy because there's so much writing on it and there will be lots of scrutiny. Mm -hmm. And so the point is, yeah, announce your conclusion, predict skeptics, and then later on down the road, I guess we'll get to see this paper and find out what fucked up bullshit you actually did, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is uh, a remarkable place to be. The New York Times and the Atlantic should be calling bullshit on this rather than amplifying it. Um, yeah, who's... I don't know, I was going to say, like, whose pocket are you in? But like... This isn't what you guys stand for. This, this, the New York Times, the Atlantic Monthly, this is not what you stand for. Well. This is not what you claim to stand for and should be standing for. If you're journalists, we, we need We need a, a, an open and free press. And instead we have sentences like, four government agencies, the National Intelligence Council, pointed to a natural origin, while two others guessed that it was a lab leak. Pointed guessed. Sorry, wrong. Um, one last point. Yeah. Uh, in this taxonomy, right, where you go from corruption to the capture of an institution to the control over some larger piece of the system, which, you know, the journalists are doing the bidding of the pharmaceutical companies and the, you know, corrupt head of uh, governmental agencies, etc. There is a question about how that emergent phenomenon happens. And certainly some of it, right, when we scratch the surface and we see that Christian Anderson and Eric Topol um, have both been greatly uh, enriched and just so happen to hold positions that are consistent with um, the powerful corrosive entity, right, we can say, oh, well, I think maybe I understand that. But then there's lots of people who are a little hard to explain, right? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to just point out that because we're dealing with an emergent phenomenon, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to abide by a single mechanism. It doesn't have to be that there's some coordinating entity that reached out to a bunch of people and, you know, figured out who was willing to do its bidding and whatever else. What it can be is that people get very good at figuring out how to get remunerated, how to get paid. And mm -hmm. paid doesn't have to be in money. It can be in social credibility, it reputation. can be reputation, it can be positions at institutions that are ascendant, whatever. Opportunities. Um, but essentially there's like a gradient of well-being. And if you take certain positions and your life starts getting better because some powerful entity takes notice that you are doing its bidding and it decides to protect you and reward you and do all of those things, then you can get a vast network of what I call freelancers to do the work for you. So in the case of the New York Times and the Atlantic, are we dealing with people, are we dealing with useful idiots, right, who don't know that what they're saying is nonsense? Are we dealing with extensions of the entities that are corrupting and controlling our system? Maybe. Or are we dealing with freelancers who noticed that when they spoke up uh, with skepticism about the lab leak hypothesis, that things started to go well for them. And when they spoke up in the other direction, things went badly and just started to do what it was that effectively this isn't. It's selection. Right. It's selection creating an emergent uh, analog of a conspiracy. Now, I'm not saying there's no conspiracy. Undoubtedly, there are many levels of one here. But there's also a lot of stuff that may well not be conspiratorial. It may be people responding to their incentives. And as you say, selection, choosing those who do the bidding of those uh, in the positions of power.